so I'm really pleased to to invite today uh, Eric Toussaint. Hey. 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 Uh, so, uh, I'm pleased to invite uh, Eric Poussin for, for this seminar. He's, uh, he's a really key activist, uh, not only at, uh, at European, but also at, at world level on the question of debt. I think it's a, it's really a major issue. And, and when I told some of the colleagues that you were here, they told me, okay, if you want to be here, we have them are probably demonstrating to them mm -hmm. that they really want to be, to be here. You, you are the international spokesperson of the EBTM, which has changed name. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's the Committee for the Abolition of Illegitimate Debt. Okay. And, <laughs> and previously for the abolition of the first Third world debt. debt. So I, I leave you the floor for 45 minutes, mm -hmm. one hour. Mm -hmm. And then we'll have three discussions here mm -hmm. and a debate with, with the audience. I, I, I think I heard that you just come back from the streets. So yes. You can say a word about that. And, and is it fine? Let's check. And I don't need the mic. You don't need the mic. Oh, yeah. You have your own. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> A word, let's see. Maybe you can say a word. Yeah, a word okay. Can. Okay, no, I don't know why they did the mic. Yeah, the mic. Tu m'entends? Do you listen to me? Okay, we, otherwise we start with the microphone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, okay. you hear me? So I'm very pleased to be with you today. I just come from the demonstration. I was very happy also to have the chance to participate to the beginning of this demonstration convoked by the intersyndicals from all the French uh, what are the objective of this uh, mobilization. Uh, so I, I will develop the question of the debt. I, I I don't know if you read the documentation I you received. Uh, it will be based on that uh, more or less. So over the, the last 10 years, with the example of Greece, uh, we have we had a very clear example of how the debt could be used by the creditors to dominate uh, an indebted country and to submit it to uh, the policies they want to, to implement. Of course, uh, uh, numerous uh, countries of the third world or the global south have been subject to such policies at least at least since the 80s so four decades uh, but at the level of europe for a lot of 
uh, people, uh, they discovered that also countries like Ireland, Portugal, uh, Greece, Cyprus, uh, Spain could be submitted also after uh, countries of the of Central or Eastern Europe. Uh, I see. I saw in the list that there are people from uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and other countries from the Balkans, and uh, they have been the country have been submitted to such uh, brutal neoliberal policies since uh, the nineties. Okay, so we we have this example in the recent period but if we analyze the the evolution of the global capitalist system since the end of the 18th century beginning of the 19th century it is very clear that uh, a lot of countries uh, have been dominated by the creditors I wrote a book on, on, on that question. It, it is published in English uh, by a market in, uh, in Chicago. The title is The Debt System. Uh, and I show in this book that countries like uh, the countries of Greed Colombia, who gained their independence in the 1820s, under the leadership of uh, Simon Bolivar. So Grand Colombia was composed by Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Panama. Uh, these countries were submitted to the interest of the creditors, uh, principally British creditors in the year 1820s during all the 19th century. Argentina also at the same period, Mexico at the same period, and uh, outside Latin America, uh, so referring to the Caribbean, we can uh, mention Haiti. Haiti in some way was the first example of a clear domination of the creditor. Uh, you may know that Haiti uh, well, the, 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 the place where the slaves uh, were victorious uh, and conquest their independence from France and at the beginning succeeded to defeat the French army. But in the year 1825-26, the government of Haiti accept to compensate the owners of the slaves uh, paying, re recognizing a debt to France of 50 million francs or, which is a very huge amount of money. And Haiti lost really its real independence with this agreement. But we can speak also of a country like China. Uh, China uh, accepted to uh, uh, ask for money to, to bankers of the West. China also, and it is linked uh, to the question of the debt, signed agreement of free trade uh, in the year 1820. And in the name of this agreement, uh, countries, different Western countries, uh, declare a war against China on the, 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 the famous opium wars against China. Uh, Greece in the year 1820s also uh, borrowed money to British bankers 
and uh, in 1826 had to accept the domination of the creditors who decided to change the new republic into a kingdom with a king from uh, Bavière, uh, Otto, uh, who, who didn't know a word of Greek and who arrived in Greece uh, only several years after, but uh, with a, a dead burden on the new state of Greece, uh, uh, very huge. Tunisia lost its independence in some way independence because it was a, a pro province of the Ottoman Empire and uh, Tunisia lost totally its independence in 1881 uh, when France occupied militarily the country to, with the argument of uh, uh, recovering the debt and transform Tunisia in protectorate. In, in reality, a, a colony. Egypt, the same in 1882, uh, with the military intervention of uh, Great Britain. Uh, and these two countries, Tunisia and Egypt, only reconquest independence in the 1950s. And uh, also the Ottoman, Ottoman empire has been dominated by the creditors at since the end of uh, the 19th century but not conquest military but dominated by a committee of the of the creditors uh, i mentioned in the question of in the case of china the link between debt and free trade uh, I will take a, a, a counter example, Japan. Japan was uh, uh, in, in, in relation with China, a peripheral economy at the beginning of the 19th century. And China was a very big economic and political power. And at the end of the 19th century, Japan was an imperialist country who succeeded to conquest Korea and Formosa, Taiwan, uh, and in, during the Second World War to conquest Philippines, Indonesia, and a part of continental uh, China. Uh, and Japan succeeded without signing, or because this country didn't sign free trade agreement and didn't uh, borrow money from uh, bank, Western borrow bankers. Uh, so this counter example uh, in some way show that uh, when a country uh, either a peripheral country or uh, relatively a major economy accept uh, to sign free trade agreement when an with an industry incapable to compete with the, the most advanced economies and accept to borrow money under the condition of the creditors he, the, his future is really uh, uh, affected by uh, negatively by this uh, uh, strate strategic decision. Um, fourth point, my first point was uh, the recent period and uh, the example of Greece. My second point was a series of countries submitted to the creditors in the 19th century. Third point, relation between debt and trade, free trade. Fourth point, local elites 
local ruling classes of the uh, peripheral economies are very interested uh, in the decision of the government to borrow money. Uh, it's a way to avoid paying, paying taxes. Uh, uh, depending of external finance, uh, allow the government or asking for external finance, allow the government not to impose uh, taxes on the ruling classes. Also, it allow the local ruling classes to have access to uh, foreign money and to import. Uh, so a big part of the foreign money borrowed very rapidly or immediately go back to the uh, creditors' country, buying uh, equipment uh, in in the years 1820s, military equipment to consolidate the independence of the country, etc. Um, and very important to understand this point. The ru local ruling classes invest a part of the money, of the capital, of the fortune in sovereign bond of their countries. So they, uh, to put in security, to put in a safe place, a part of the gains, they export capital and they buy in London, in now in Wall Street uh, or in other financial centers, so sovereign bonds of the countries. It's a key point because if you want to, if you ask yourself why uh, till now we have very few examples of uh, local elites uh, in favor of suspending the payment of the external debt if you don't take into account that they are themselves creditors of their country, you, you cannot understand why they are not in favor of the suspension of payment. Including they, they could be against the government. I will give you a, a, a recent example or contemporary example. The Venezuelan bourgeoisie was against the government of Chavez, was against and is against the government of Maduro. But they are not in favor of the suspension of the payment of the debt because they invest in the sovereign bond uh, issued by Chavez government and Maduro government in Wall Street. Uh, it's very, so it's a, a key point to understand the, uh, some behavior of the uh, local elites and to, to understand what is happening in Lebanon with the local elites and in country like that, because they are not, the, the country are immensely indebted and they are to keep on paying the debt. And so they are in favor to ask the IMF to give money to the uh, government to allow the country to keep on uh, paying the interest of the, on the bonds. Um, fifth point, uh, I use the formula of debt system to name the mechanism of domination through the debt uh, relation and the transfer of wealth from the little producers, workers, peasants, 
uh, to the local and foreign creditors. Six, six point. Contrary to the mainstream explanation, the sovereign debt crisis of the global south, but also of the periphery of Europe, uh, like uh, the sovereign debt crisis of, for instance, of Greece, the sovereign debt crisis are not caused, provoked by the debtors' countries. These crises have in general their origin in the creditors' countries. So I will give you a few key examples. The, the first debt crisis in the history of cap global capitalism began in 1826. In the, you, you had the cycle of the capitalist economy in Europe with an important growth of the, the production, but also in the last period before the crisis of the financial sector and speculative uh, activity of the capital. And in 1825, December, we had the first uh, bank banking crash in the capitalist history. In, in the yeah, global capitalist history uh, with the, the, the bankruptcy on dozens of British bankers. Uh, these bankers had lent money to the new independent countries of Latin America Mexico, Greece, Colombia, Argentina, uh, also to Greece. Uh, I will sp speak about at what condition, but they, they lend a lot of money proportionally to, this, to the economies of these countries. But the crisis was provoked by the speculation in Great Britain not by the suspension of payment by these countries to the British bankers. We had a bankruptcy of the banks for, I would say, internal reason of the uh, British economy. And because the bank, the banks went bankrupt, they were incapable or they decided, the other one, to stop the credit, the new lending to the peripheral economies. And these peripheral economies so were incapable to refinance the external debt to be capable to keep on paying the interest. They, in, so the, the crash of the banks is December 25. During six to 12 months, all the debtors country keep on paying debt, but because they didn't succeed in issuing new bonds in uh, London, and because there are no other capital uh, like Paris uh, wanted to uh, 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 gave uh, to give loans to these countries, they entered in default. We can take uh, an example. There, there were other financial crises in the 19th century, but I will uh, pass to the crisis of the 1930s. We had the crash in Wall Street in October 29, and uh, it provoked a huge depression in Europe. 
and several uh, European economies, uh, Germany, Belgium, Italy, France, Great Britain, suspended, suspended that their payment to the USA, the debt to the USA, uh, the debt due or linked to the loans and to the help given by uh, uh, the US Army and the US economy during the First World War. And after that, uh, 14 Latin American countries entered in default of payment. So it's not the default of payment of the uh, Latin American countries who provoked the crisis in the imperialist countries, in the center of the economy, it is the crisis, the financial crisis at the center of the main imperialist country, uh, whose name is the USA in, in this period until now, uh, who provoke a succession of default. If we take the crisis of uh, the first generalized third world debt crisis, which began in uh, 1982, with the risk of default of uh, Mexico. Uh, what were the causes? What, what, what was the reason who provoked this crisis? That's the decision of the director of the Federal Reserve of the US, the USA, Paul Volcker, who decided in October 79 to increase brutally, dramatically, the interest rate uh, dictated by the Federal Reserve and who influenced the LIBOR interest rate with the London Interbank uh, offer rate rate, which is the interbank rate uh, of interest, that this unilateral decision of the US authorities combined with the uh, uh, reduction of the price of oil and other commodities who provoke the third world debt crisis. And we can think about the coming crisis. 2023, 2024, you know, the World Bank, the IMF, in the last report say there is more than 100 peripheral economies or emerging economies which are which are at the eve of uh, a debt crisis and uh, very near a situation of default uh, several economies enter already in default Sri Lanka is in full suspension of payments since April two, uh, 2022. Uh, Pakistan, Tunisia, Lebanon, Bangladesh uh, are nearby such default. Uh, Zambia is already in default. Ghana is in default since uh, two months uh, and um, it is probable that more and more countries will enter in, uh, in default or they can avoid the default but they will have to sign an agreement with the IMF to receive uh, 
emergency loans to be able to pay the interest on the sovereign, the sovereign bonds. And what is provoking that? External ex exogenous shocks. Uh, the decision of uh, the Federal Reserve and now the European Central Bank to increase the interest rate, not so dramatically as Volcker did in 79, but it's, uh, it's huge because uh, uh, one hour and a an half ago, the interest rate in the US was 0 0.25. Now it is almost for, uh, for a percent of interest rate. Um, the, and they will keep on increasing the interest rate. And the ECB began uh, one year after the, the Federal Reserve, and now uh, the interest rate of the European Central Bank is 2.75. And uh, Christine Lagarde announced that they will keep on increasing the, the interest rate. And this uh, uh, increase in the interest rate provoke a repatriation of capital to the main economies, principally the US, the US economy. And so for the peripheral economies who were in good position to issue bonds at very low interest rates in the last years, when they have to issue new bonds to pay back the old debt, now they have to pay 3%, 5%, 9%, 10%, 12%, 13% interest rate. And uh, they enter very, very fast in very huge difficult difficulties of refinancing the debt. My seventh point is uh, returning to the 19th century. Often the conditions uh, in which the debt has been issued also explain the impossibility for the debt debtor country to get rid of the original debt. Uh, analyzing the, 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 the credit or the, the condition in which the sovereign debt has been issued in the years 1820, it, it's very impressive. Um, Maybe I, I, I have to mention uh, one aspect. When, uh, when we speak about external debt, I imagine you know that there are several types of creditors and several way of uh, uh, borrow money. But the main uh, instrument, instrument now is issuing sovereign bonds. So sending in Wall Street, in London, in Luxembourg, in some other uh, financial capitals to sell bonds in the name of the country. So a country is printing bonds. Uh, Gen generally in dollars or in uh, pounds or euros. Uh, and they sell these bonds through banks in the les bourses, in the financial market of some countries. Uh, this is a 
the present situation is like that. And at the beginning, so exactly 200 years ago, it was exactly like that. So it was the, the country didn't go to a banker asking for a loan. Uh, a country was going to a banker who said, I will print uh, in the name of your country, sovereign bond, and I will sell these bonds to others in the stock exchange of my country, London, Paris, etc. And so, because I am organizing the, the, the issue of the bonds, I will take a commission. In, in the 1820, generally eight to 10 percent of commission. Okay. And uh, secondly, I will, the, the, the bankers said to the countries, we will sell you bonds at a discount price. So if the bond is 100 pounds, I will sell the, the bond for 90 pounds. But your debt is 100 pounds. I will sell it at 90 pounds. On this 90 pounds, I will take 10% of 100. Uh, I will uh, take the three first years of repayment of the interest, and I will give you uh, uh, the rest. It could be 60% or 50% of the amount of the new debt with an interest rate uh, on the nominal value of the bond. So a country uh, issue for 1 million of bonds, of sovereign bond, it will receive maybe 500,000 pounds. But he will have to pay the interest rate on the nominal value. So if it is 6% of interest rate, it is on the nominal value of the bond. And it is a coupon that the country has to pay each year. And at the end of the, 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 the period of the, the life of the bond, it could be 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. The country should pay back the total amount of the nominal value of the bond. So in, the, in this period, uh, I, I show in my, in, in my book, the debt system, that uh, several countries receive around 30 to 40 percent of the amount of they were supposed to receive. They receive this money, but for instance, in the case of the Latin American countries, with this money received by the guy sent by the, govern the government in London, <coughs> this guy bought equipment uh weapons clothes and at the at the end more or less quasi no money uh, arrived in the in the country um so in this epoch the condition in which the bonds were issued uh, i would say was originally odious because uh, the, the, the creditors and the intermediary, the bankers uh, uh, imposed to the, 
to such new government and in some case it's already to show you the the, the situation at the beginning they so to, to show you one aspect of the at what happened in the 1820s several of this government uh did not uh uh complete the full independence of the country they were still in war against spain uh, in the case of greece against the ottoman empire because greece was a province of the ottoman empire and uh, so the bankers were so enthusiastic to uh, recycle the money was uh, in in London that they accepted to give loans to authorities who have not the full uh, recognition as power, independent power uh, in the global uh, uh, capitalist system. Um, so I, I was telling you at the beginning, but it's very important the beginning <laughs> because it's very important. I, I would say at the beginning, it was absolutely odious, very abusive condition, which made the loans or the, the debt impossible to really uh, reimburse. So which forced the country to permanently ask newly for new uh, for, for, for new money, not new loans, for issuing new bonds, etc. And I, I, I mentioned that you can say, but it was 200 years ago and but to explain uh, why it is very important and to give you an example guatemala in 1953 i think asked for a loan to the world bank and the imf imf and world bank were created at the end of the second world war in 1944 and the IMF and the World Bank say to the countries, okay, the first condition to allow you to borrow money to us is to pay back the debt of a bond issued in 1824. This bond has been in suspension of payment. First, you have to compensate the the owners of the bonds uh, so to to show you that there is a, a long history of the bond including defaulted bonds uh, their life can keep on and uh, creditors could use uh, institution like the IMF and the World Bank to impose a discipline or to, or to try to impose after that i will show you that uh, 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 was more, fortunately uh, a lot of countries didn't accept this uh, imposition okay point eight in front of periodical default due to big financial crisis in the north creditors country use the armies to invade debtors countries in the 19th century until the first world war it was considered as normal to use 
the army to impose the discipline to the debtor countries. Uh, it, we know the expression la politique de la canonnière, which, which means to use gunboats uh, to blackmail China, to blackmail uh, Venezuela, to blackmail Argentina, uh, etc. La politique de la canonnière. And um, uh, I will show you uh, several, some example of, of that. More recently, uh, at and particularly in the last four decades, so I, I would say there, there has been no more invasion of a country since the First World War. The last invasion in the name to recover debt is the US invasion of Haiti in 1915 uh, during the First World War. Uh, there have been a lot of international debate on that and uh, the International Court of Justice of Den Haag, La Haye, has been created at the beginning of the 19th century to try to litigate on such uh, conflict between countries around the question of the debt. And several uh, uh, international law doctrines emerge, like the Drago and Calvo doctrine, uh, but I will not enter in the uh, in, in, in this uh, point because I, I, I would be too, too long. Between the First World War and the year 17th, 1970s, uh, the creditors have no real power to blackmail countries, it was not anymore possible to invade, etc. And uh, there, there, there have been a lot of suspension of payment, of repudiation, etc. And, and so the IMF and the World Bank, which have been created in 1944, to help uh, the stability of the monies, the, the IMF, the, the purpose of the IMF was the stability of the monies at international scale. The World Bank, its responsibility was rebuilding Europe and in some way helping the third world country to, to develop themselves. Uh, these two institutions succeeded in instrumentalizing, using as a tool, the third world debt crisis of the 1980s to impose the structural adjustment programs. So we have not any more invasion, but we have imposition of agreement between the debtor countries and the international institution, especially the IMF, with a lot, uh, a long list of conditionalities to impose a model. So no more weapons, but structural adjustment program. And we can say that in some way, the World Bank and the IMF are the gendarme of the, the creditors. My point 10, in the last, the two last centuries, 
a series of cash successfully repudiated their debt. So I will give you a list and uh, I will not develop. I will give some information, but France in 1797, the national convention decided uh, what is known as la banqueroute de deux tiers, the bankruptcy of the two thirds. So the national convention decided to repudiate two thirds of the debt reclaimed to the Republic. Uh, Portugal in 1837 decided to repudiate a debt uh, 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 issued by a king which was in a struggle with his sister who was the legal king. The USA, in the USA, four states in the year 1837 repudiated debt uh, accumulated by governors who made corrupt agreement with bankers with the pretext of building uh, railways uh, who were not really uh, built and uh, because of the corruption. And the uh, citizen of four states of the US entered in rebellion, change of governors and the new governors to repudiate the debt. And the Supreme Court of the US say to the bankers, there is no way to sue uh, in the US uh, the, the states, members of the union. Private person cannot sue uh, public authorities. It was the case in the 19th century in the US. In 1865, at the end of the civil war in the US, uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, succeed to, to convene the, the Congress to adopt the 14th Amendment, who say that the country of the South, so the Confederation, uh, should repudiate their debt if they want to enter again in the Union. In 1898, the US, after defeating the Spanish army in front of Santiago de Cuba, decided to repudiate the debt uh, owed by Cuba, which was a colony to Spain. The, so the US decided to repudiate the debt, the Cuban debt to Spain. Uh, and Spain accepted this repudiation. In some way, the, the, in this case, uh, there are three cases of countries of the North, but we can take other example. Mexico, under the presidency of Benito Juarez in 1861, repudiate a debt issued by um, uh, con, uh, uh, a sector of the local elites who took the power, usurpators, uh, against the liberal republic and the liberal government of uh, Benito Juarez. France declared the war against Mexico invaded Mexico with 35,000, uh, an army of 35,000 soldiers. And France was defeated by, the, by Mexico. 
1867, and uh, Mexico repudiated not only the previous debt, which was odious, but the new debt uh, issued by Maximilien d'Autriche, who was claimed emperor of uh, Mexico, uh, imposed by Napoleon III to the Mexican people. And it was a, a very huge victory of Mexico against its creditors. Later, in uh, 1913, during the first modern Mexican revolution, under the President Carranza, and with the influence of Emiliano Zapata and uh, Pancho Villa, uh, the government of Mexico repudiated the debt uh, issued by General Huerta. And it was a huge victory in 1943 against the cartel of the creditors after almost three decades of suspension of payment. Soviet Russia repudiated debt in 1918. Costa Rica repudiated debt in 1919. China repudiated its ex big part of external debt with the revolution of 1949. Indonesia repudiated the debt to the ex uh, colonizator, uh, the Netherlands, in 1956. Guinea Conakry repudiated debt reclaimed by France and, and gaining its independence from France. Cuba repudiated debt in 1959. Algeria at the independence repudiate the colonial debt reclaimed by France. Iran repudiate debt after the overthrow of the Shah in 79. Paraguay repudiated debt in 2005 again, against Swiss bankers. Ecuador in some way repudiated debt in 2008-2009 and Iceland repudiated that also in 2008-2010. And they were, in this, all these cases, it was a victory. So there is also a long list of repudiation. J'ai parlé combien de temps, David? Bon. Uh, so, after the first succession of repudiation of debt in the year 1920s, so after the Mexican repudiation, the US repudiation, the Soviet repudiation, Costa Rican repudiation, also the Treaty, Treaty of Versailles, who cancel debt. Uh, from Poland to the uh, German Empire and to the to the, to Prussia, Prussia also. Uh, a Russian jurist, lawyer, Alexander Naum Sack, elaborated a doctrine. This uh, jurist was Professor of uh, law in St. Petersburg during the Tsarist Empire. He, he opposed the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. He went to the Baltic Republic and he, he finished here in Paris in uh, 1924, and he began to analyze all the litigation between the French Revolution up to the 90, to the year 
1920s. And uh, his conclusion, known as the doctrine of odious death, says the follow following thing. He say, in general, for him, there is a general principle of succession of debt. Uh, a new government, a new regime should assume the obligation contracted by the previous government. But he says there is an exception. If the debt is odious, this debt is null and void and should not be paid by the new government or the new regime. And there are two conditions to define a debt as odious, he said. First, the population didn't enjoy the benefit of the debt. The debt was accumulated against the interest of the people. And second criteria, the creditors, the lenders knew that or are incapable to make the proof that it was impossible for them to know that. So the charge of the proof is on the creditors. They should demonstrate that it was impossible for them to know that the debt, uh, uh, the credit given to the government was not accumulated against the interest of the population. So and he say when the two criteria are gathered, it is an odious debt and it should be uh, abolished, canceled, the government can repudiate it. So that's the doctrine of the odious debt. It is interesting and as CADTM, as Committee for the Abolition of Legitimate Debt, we are uh, using this doctrine. It was elaborated by a, a person who was a conservator. He was opposed to the revolution, but he analyzed uh, a lot of litigation. And he said, there is absolutely that the nature of the government who took the debt has no importance. It could be a monarchic government. It could be a despotic government. It could be a republic. Uh, it's not important. The question is not the, the nature of the regime. The, the question is the use of the money. It is very interesting. So a uh, democratic government uh, we can have the case, a democratic government has accumulated debt against the interest of the population of the country with the complicity of the creditors. It's very important. Uh, because uh, I have only uh, a few minutes, I, I, I would say. So in the case of Greece, I was uh, the co scientific coordinator of the audit committee of the Greek debt in, uh, and, uh, at the request of the president of the Greek parliament in 2015 when uh, Tsipras was uh, the first minister, the prime minister of Greece. Uh, and the conclusion of our audit commission was to say, okay, the Greek government of Papandreou, who was a socialist, uh, was a democratic government. But the debt he accepted from the Troika 
Don the cartel between the IMF, the ECB, and the European Commission, this debt was used for implementing violations of the Greek constitution and violation of uh, several elemental rights of the Greek population. And it was accumulated in the interest of the creditors, principally Germany, France, because their banks received the money given by the Troika to the Greek government. So we, we uh, wrote a, a report of more than 100 pages and presented to the Greek parliament in June 2015. Uh, you can find this, uh, this uh, report. Uh, I am just so finishing with the uh, prison situation. I already say, said something. Uh, the central banks of the main economies, uh, Western economies are increasing the interest. Uh, so the interest rate of the main economy are increased by the main central banks. The, the Fed, the Bank of England, the ECB. Uh, and this is changing the world situation. We are entering in a new phase of the crisis of the capitalist system. Uh, it, is, uh, it is not clear exactly what will happen and what will be the rhythm of what will happen, what is the calendar. But it is absolutely clear that more and more countries uh, will be in very huge difficulty to pay back their debt. So the question of auditing the in external and domestic debt with the participation of the citizenship, it is, is very important to uh, discuss with the citizenship how to deal with this debt because uh, it is the case of the economy of peripheral countries. There are new creditors also, China, it's an important new creditor uh, for a lot of countries. Countries like France or my country, Belgium, has increased strongly the public debt in the last five years responding with the policy of Macron, uh, quoi qu'il en coûte, and now the ratio of uh, the French public debt to the GDP of France is 115%. And you know that in the Maastricht Treaty, it should not be more than 60% of the GDP. It is 115% of your GDP. And so now, Macron is telling that uh, we should make uh, cuts in public spending to pay back the debt and to reduce the ratio of the public debt to the GDP. And we say we should first analyze uh, who, who profit from this debt, why France has accumulated this debt. Maybe it is because Macron decided not to tax the rich. And so because he didn't tax the rich, they, they went richer and richer, and France had to borrow money from these rich who are buying the sovereign bonds of France 
and receiving interest rates on the bond of France and keeping on increasing their wealth. So it's in form of, of conclusion to say the question of the debt is not a question of what happened 200 years ago and now the, the things are, are completely different. Is to learn from history to see the differences between what happened in the past, but also to see some continuity and uh, uh, the necessity to uh, challenge the, uh, this question of the debt reclaimed to, to a country and, and to the people. Uh, merci beaucoup. Many thanks. <laughs> t'asseoir, vous donner le micro à... Je vais te mettre de l'autre côté, mais bon, on peut venir là, je pense. Donc, ah, ils vont venir là. Ils vont venir là. So, and if you are interested, I, I can make three copies of my last book in French. Uh, it's a book on the history of the World Bank. It will be published in, in English in July by Pluto in uh, London. Je rien vu, moi. Ah. Hello, uh, my name is Marla. I'm an Epoch 2 student. Firstly, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very interesting as the material that we read. Um, today, we plan together with Nua and uh, Juan Manuel to go a bit deeper into uh, what we read of your work and maybe also expand a bit upon it. And um, of course, we have questions. So each of us will conclude with a question, which we'll summarize also at the end. Um, but firstly, to start, I would like to give a small overview again um, on the more recent history of debt in the Global South. So uh, starting in the 60s and 70s, that became one of the key instruments for neocolonialism, especially Latin America was borrowing extensively in order to develop. Um, this was further fueled by low interest rates in um, the global north, uh, which gave access to uh, cheap credit by several institutions, by bank, but banks, private banks, but also, for example, by the World Bank, of course, also by the interest um, to expand, for example, US influence. Um, in the 80s, this was uh, very much reversed. We had at the end of the 80s, the Falker shock, which as you said before, was um, a shock of very high interest rates in the global north, which heavily also impacted the global south. Uh, moreover, there was a fall in commodity prices, which worsened the situation. Mexico became the first country um, announcing it's incapable to pay, which was followed by several other um, economies, um, which led to the IMF to grant loans under strong conditionalities. So then the 90s became uh, the decade of the implementation of these conditionalities, which came with trade liberalization, uh, tax reforms, capital flows, liberalizations. Um, and also at the beginning of the 90s, there was the foundation of the Committee for the Abolition of Third World Debt, now illegitimate debt. Um, then the 2000s uh, were characterized by, again, an increase in commodity prices, also an increasing role in China in lending to the global south and uh, low interest rates in the West after the financial crisis. Um, and there we have the example of Ecuador, which opted for non-payment of odious debt in 2007 successfully. Um, oh yeah, here we are. What is this? Well, um, <laughs> from 2010 onwards, we have increasing interest rates in the US again and falling commodity prices, which then of course conclusively triggered several debt crises. For example, in Argentina, Venezuela, Turkey, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Mozambique. 
And now with 2020, we see the next crisis with COVID that led to lockdowns also in the global south, which led to falling production, falling exports, um, and um, again, forest countries of the global south to demand loans by the IMF and the World Bank. Um, and we see an accelerated capital flight, also much worse than during the 2008 crisis, worsening the situation. Um, so now, based on this, I would like to look at the consequences of the option of non-payment of debt, especially in the light of um, the evolution of political sovereignty and economic autonomy. So firstly, you emphasize in your work that um, the power relations that result from debt relations, especially the conditionalities of creditors, interfere with the political sovereignty of states. Um, one such example could be the reduction of capital controls that were widely enforced during the 90s, which diminished the um, possibility of monetary policy in the affected countries. Another example could be the role the IMF uh, played in the promotion of central bank independence, also mainly in the 90s, uh, which of course on the one hand ensures uh, creditors um, some stability in uh, inflation and some, some uh, restriction to government spending. But of course, this also has the negative effect that these um, economies are restricted in how they can use central bank spending to finance themselves. And also means that sovereign debt dynamics now underlie market dynamics. Moreover, debt has been used as a tool for economic subordination, meaning that, again, for example, conditionalities force the global south into economic competition through liberalization, again, the abandonment of capital controls and the privatization of public companies. What that means is that many economies end up as very export-oriented, mainly extraction-dominated, um, which on the other hand, of course, means cheap prices for the global north. So now, um, summarizing the subordination through debt, both limits political sovereignty and economic autonomy. Of course, the both are mutually reinforcing. We can't clearly distinguish them, but we can say that there's some um, consequences from that. So, for example, there's an increased foreign debt reliance. There's a bias towards export-driven economies based on primary goods, which then also hinders national industrial policy. So now, observing this, we see that the subordination through debt is not just a uh, a phenomenon will happen in time, but it has real consequences on institutions, on economic trade patterns over time. And now, um, starting from this observation, I think it's interesting to look again at the possibility of a non-payment of debt, which um, historically we can see was linked to the possibility of triggering difficulties in borrowing, in accessing foreign markets. Um, one example that you mentioned is that of with the Russian non-payment after the October Revolution, 1917 which um, led to a blockage by the countries which mainly held that debt more than any other country, France, um, and also led to the situation that no other country was willing to export to Russia because the gold that they would have gotten in exchange was claimed by the Allies as being um, rightfully theirs. So now the question is, how can countries that over decades are, um, are subject to the separation through debt deal with these consequences? Um, that at least probably for some time will be um, in place. In the case of Russia, in the end, many countries made trade agreements with them again because they depended also on Russian exports. Um, however, I suppose that um, diminished um, political sovereignty and economic autonomy could worsen these effects. So this leads me to my, my question, which is what were the past determinants of successful non-payment of debt? And does the historical subordination through debt and creditors conditionalities impact countries' capacity to deal with the potential retaliatory consequences of the non-payment of debt. Well, um, thanks, Marla. I wanted to continue with a bit with the topic of sovereign debt crisis and the resolution mechanisms that exist. So first, uh, a bit of the landscape that today we see on the restructuring. Uh, there is a problem and a vicious cycle with debt. That is, uh, there are volatile markets and uh, capital outflows from developing countries, mostly that uh, lead to devaluation, for example. And this increased the costs of the servicing for this country. 
Therefore, uh, they have to ask for new loans to pay older ones. And usually these new loans come with fiscal austerity conditionalities leading to lower growth and lower payment capacity entering in this uh, kind of vicious cycle. Uh, recently, we have seen uh, additional tensions for the sustainability that were already mentioned. Uh, for example, the COVID crisis, the rate hikes from uh, advanced central banks also, and the global, the global recession that might come in the to in this year and the following. Um, we have seen uh, the, uh, the, uh, there is a concept of too little too late in debt restructuring. That means that these debt restructuring processes usually uh, come too late. They take uh, too much time to be solved for the countries and they come with too little relief for them also. For example, here, we see uh, the, it's the share of uh, debt restructuring processes that um, have followed with another restructuration of the debt or default in the next T number of years. So almost half of the restructuring processes um, followed by another restructuring uh, or default in the next three years only. And that's a huge failure for these kind of processes. Uh, well, to, uh, Professor Toussaint uh, asked in his paper who is helping who in terms of uh, this debt uh, that advanced countries uh, provide to mostly the global south. And this is because of the payments uh, of interest uh, from the indebted countries to the creditor countries, but also because of uh, profits that uh, are being sent from these countries to the advanced countries and uh, the uh, natural resources that are exported. Uh, this question is also uh, interesting to, to take into account regarding the restructuring processes because of the um, international uh, architecture and the role of the international institutions in these processes. Guzman uh, Stiglitz uh, mentioned that there is a non-system of the restructuring right now. And this means that there is a lack of uh, legal regulations or statutory regimes uh, to solve them. and at the end, uh, we end up with discretionary negotiations between countries and creditors. Uh, lately, um, collective action clauses has been, have been included in, in debt contracts. This means that um, when a country reaches an agreement with a certain amount of uh, the bondholders, the rest of them have to also agree on, on this agreement. This reduce a bit, for example, the scope of action of Bolter funds, but they have proved to be less helpful. Uh, they have proved to be helpful, but less than was expected when they were introduced. Finally, uh, for example, the UN has uh, signed a resolution in 2015 with principles for sovereign debt rest uh, restructuring, but these principles are not binding. So we end up again with a kind of non-system of the restructuring. So this leads to my question, and I wanted to ask you your opinion on the necessity of a, an international system of sovereign debt restructuring that is based on statutory principles and not only on the negotiation between parts. Um, and also ask you if this is possible in the context of finalized capitalism and the emergence of these huge uh, internationalized private hedge funds. Thank you. Um, and also we will show a recap of all the questions at the end so you don't get lost with our curiosity. So um, I will talk a little bit about post-colonial links and South to South cooperation as a way to um, lessen the dependence on um, the global North. So um, first of all, 
Yep. So first of all, uh, we have talked about, you have mentioned already that the um, general sentiment about um, the physical uh, um, presence of army um, and um, the classical way of colonization has changed and it's fr like looked down upon recently. It's a little too late. But um, so there's a new that emerged as a more subtle way of establishing the same dependency or enforcing it without that administration and army presence on uh, the land. So um, my colleagues have already covered some of the ways that that happens. So when the creditors lend with high interest rates, creating a debt trap and therefore dependence, resource exploitation. So um, they demand access to natural resources as collateral and therefore receiving these resources for cheaper, control of government. So for example, I come from Tunisia and we still have um, it, this lingering feeling in every kind of policy of the French um, uh, decision-making in what we do. And so creditors may gain influence over countries' government through that, enabling them to shape policies and politics to their advantage, like many years after their dependence, and then putting the developing countries into competition against each other. So the South, um, global South countries against each other, and that pushing them to adopt an economic model based on exports and then the extraction of raw materials for foreign markets. And that will enable um, developed uh, economies to reduce the price of exported commodities to receive uh, or to be able to reduce the production costs and increase the profits uh, of their companies. Now, this is a way or one of the ways that um, post colonies still struggle to um, defeat these colonial links but one other way is um, relying on more multilateral uh, collaborations and cooperations and one of these ways is uh, MDB so multilateral development uh, banks for example the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the New Development Bank and they are more focused on the social and economic development of developing countries and more poorer countries. And we might ask, how do they differ from the existing developing, uh, from the existing multilateral banks? So for example, the membership, they have more broader membership base. So they include developing and developed countries. Their focus is the infrastructure development in their regions um, of the shareholder countries, but also uh, the more affected um, countries in a certain region, while the existing banks have a broader development mandate. They also work, um, they differ in terms of funding, so they are largely largely funded by member countries versus how ex the existing um, multilateral banks, they depend on combination of member countries and international capital markets. And then finally, in terms of governance, um, there is a more equal distribution of voting power among member countries, while the existing type is dominated by developed countries. But here we want to talk whether they have the same challenges, whether they are more effective. So one of the challenges that are common between these two types of institutions is that the risk of overlanding and, and uh, unsustainable debt, so financing these large infrastructure projects that can lead to a buildup of debt, which can be common to both existing and new developing uh, multilateral banks. There also the lack of transparency and accountability because they are not subject to the same level of transparency um, as traditional international uh, financial institutions, which will be one of my questions later. And then the opportunities, they pro promote more increased um, representation of developing countries, their perspective, their needs and increased representation of the uh, an influence for them in the global development finance landscape. And then it presents an alternative opportunity for financing to reduce reliance on traditional development finance sources. Um, and that can be shown here. This is from the OECD uh, report. And um, I would say that this portrays the inflows of funding for multilateral 
uh, developing banks and the outflows. So the, how they are funded and how they fund. And the increasing trend of um, how they are receiving funds and that the fact that they are contributing shows that there is an increasing trust and effectiveness in these institutions. In 2018, total funding to the multilateral organizations reached um, a peak that, so far, and it's 71.9 billion US dollars, which is 38% of the gross official development assistance. And in terms of how, how they fund, um, there is also an increasing trend, uh, but most of it is I don't hear because of the colors, it's not showing. It's supposed to be both concessional and non-concessional. Um, and um, the non-concessional is actually higher in each one of them. Um, the concessional is higher in each one. And that shows how uh, most of these funding are going to, in the past few years, to middle income countries um, because they're the ones who are able to afford um, market-based interest rates. But most of these funding are going to infrastructure and production uh, as the primary beneficiaries and uh, infrastructure received 27% um, of these total uh, funds in 2018, while productive sector received 25%. Um, I would question, um, it would make sense why middle, come in, middle income countries would be the receivers of fundings in the general trend but that takes away the focus to the poorer countries, which were the very first reason these institutions exist. So these are our references and a recap of the questions. My two colleagues already covered the two first set of questions and I'll cover mine now. So I would like to ask our current multilateral development efforts enough to establish um, developing countries sovereignty and development. What challenges does South to South cooperation initiatives face and what recommendations to, to guarantee their effectiveness since their focus is now being shifted to the less needing countries? And also in the chapter, you mentioned the theoretical assumptions behind um, high uh, levels of debt. So it says the main function of foreign capital inflow is to increase the rate of domestic capital formation up to a level which could be maintained without any further aid, which has not been the case. So I would like to know, do you think that these institutions still, like the World Bank and IMF, still push for such a narrative to legitimize high levels of foreign debt or dependence, between parentheses, and is it still as convincing as a narrative right now than it was back then? Thank you so much. Yeah, okay, give it. Okay. The mic? Maybe you can go back. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you submitted it. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, what is your name? Noot. Noot? Oh, the... Noot, N O U R. Oh. And the guy? Juan. Juan, Juan, okay. And Marla, Marla, okay. Thank you. Ah. So I'm now at the level of the timing is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, retaliation. Uh, against a country who suspend the payment of the debt. I, uh, in a new article, I can send to you the, the link. I uh, quote a study made by uh, Stiglitz. It was published in 2010, uh, in which it, it was based mainly on analyzing what happened with Argentina, suspension of payment in 2001, uh, and the suspension of payment from the Russian Federation in 1998. And he shows, uh, is showing this uh, study that uh, in reality, the uh, main narrative 
mainstream narrative who say that uh, this country will be uh, excluded from the financial uh, market and uh, uh, all the alternative financial sources uh, are not verified. And that in, in reality, uh, the capacity of retaliation uh, is low uh, from the part of the creditors. And the possibility of a country so to to be to to take advantage of a suspension of payment is important. I was part of the audit process in Ecuador uh, as part of the commission created by the president of Ecuador in 2007. We recommended after one after 14 months of auditing the debt reclaim to Ecuador, we recommend we advise the government to suspend the payment. They suspended the payment uh, part of the commercial debt and they have been victorious against the the bond holders. So they suspend the payment of uh, three thousand million uh, dollars sovereign bank bonds in November 2008 and uh, a concrete consequences of a suspension of payment is that these bonds on the secondary market uh, the price of this bond went brutally down uh, to 20% of the value. And uh, of course, you can have vulture funds who use that to buy this debt at a very huge discount price. But the government can also uh, uh, buy its own sovereign debt at this discount price using uh, some uh, some uh, subterfuge subterfuge what is it so in the case of ecuador uh, ecuador ask bank of lazar which exists here in france uh, to not officially at the name of ecuador to buy back to buy the bond at a discount price of 80% uh, discount price. And uh, so officially the bank has any actors in the secondary market bought these bonds. In reality, it was in favor of the Ecuadorian government. And when the Ecuadorian government reached uh, a certain amount of bonds, he made an official offer to the bond holders who didn't, uh, or who still have uh, the bonds, and he said, we will buy, uh, and uh, that the ultimate offer, the bonds at 30% of the value. And so they succeed, in buying back in total 91% of the of the bond. Uh, it was a huge victory, no retaliation, no litigation in a, in a, in a US court because they succeed with 91%. And you know, you refer, Juan referred to the CAC, so the collective action Clauses. Uh, if you read generally, it depends of the prospectus of the issuing the the bond. But in general, is if you have if you get seventy five percent of the bonds, the minority, the outsiders, cannot sue you. Uh, 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 
in front of a tribunal in the US uh, if it is uh, under the law of uh, the state of New York or if it is the law English law in uh, in front of a, a court in Britain so uh, you can have blackmail against the country with suspending the payment but the real life show that a country who really take sovereign unilateral decision of suspension of payment and forcing the bond holders to accept the restructuration uh, the in general there is a victory of the country so the second point I don't uh, have any illusion in the possibility to build now an international system of sovereign debt restructuring. So since the beginning of the 19th century in Den Haag, they discuss the necessity of that. Drago discussed that with uh, Porter, who represents the US. They discussed that at the beginning of the creation of the World Bank. They discussed that after the Argentinian default, when Ann Kruger, which was deputy uh, director of the IMF, proposed. Uh, a mechanism, a collective mechanism. They discussed that after General Assembly in 2015, and nothing happened. So, uh, my conclusion, of course, I would like to see the creation of an international body who can uh, uh, arbitrate conflict, but in the present situation, my recommendation to the government is to act unilaterally as sovereign state, a fun, uh, uh, supporting the decision on argument of international law and domestic law. And uh, uh, if you accept to enter in a long discussion with your creditors and uh, institution like the IMF, you will you will lose the battle because they they are more capable to force you to long discussion, which will conclude with the restructuration which is against your interest. You will receive in two days, Jean-Claude Trichet, he will say exactly the contrary. Uh, it is clear. Trichet organized the restructuration of the Greek debt in 2012. And, uh, and it was totally against the Greek, the Greek, the, the, the interest of the population of Greece, but he will say, of course, the contrary. He, uh, never he will recognize that he defends the interest of BNP Paribas, Société Générale, Crédit Agricole, who, who was important creditors of Greece and the Deutsche Bank and the Commerzbank and ING from the, the Netherlands and Dexia Bank from Belgium. Uh, but it was the case. I, I can, if I had the, the chance to demonstrate that in front of him, I'm sure that I will gain the debate with him. Uh, I know his argument. Uh, he will tell you, if you ask him about the Greek restructuration, that's a very uh, positive example of a good restructuration in which the, they impose 
a discount of 50% of the value of the bonds. It will not tell you that the, the, the pension system, the Greek pension system, lot a lot of money because the Greek pension system was forced one year before the restructuration to buy Greek sovereign bonds who were uh, the, radio, the, the value was reduced of 50%. And they, they were the losers. When BNP Paribas, at the time, thanks to Trichet, to, to uh, sell on the secondary market the bonds to others, like the Cyprus banks, who never imagined what Trichet will do. And the Cyprus. The, the banks of Cyprus, thinking that, were, that they were making a, a good a deal, uh, lost a lot of money with the Greek restructuration. And Cyprus entered in a new crisis in 2013. He will not explain that, of course. Uh, okay. So, oh, I, 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 hope that in the next decades, like what happened after the Second World War, we will have the possibility to define new democratic institution. Uh, and after the Second World War, it was not a so, so, so a huge victory, but the UN Declaration of Human Rights and the UN Organization was a positive thing. Uh, but just now, the re really that the or a front of debtors country, like Sankara was asking for, or a sovereign act of a sovereign state. Uh, third question: New development banks. I have. I am not enthusiastic with the brick the BRICS bank, so the, the, the new development bank and all the banks created by the, uh, emerging economies like uh, or new, very uh, powerful economies like uh, Chinese economy, like China or India, they're reproducing more or less the same type of uh, priorities, behavior, etc. cetera. Uh, my, my friend, uh, Patrick Bond, who is based in South Africa, is analyzing sharply what this uh, new multilateral bank are doing. I can recommend you to, 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 to read uh, is is analysis and i personally participated in 2007 as advisor to the ecuadorian government i participated to the negotiation of the intent to create the bank of the south between seven latin american countries so i was in the uh, participating, invited to participate to the meeting of the finance ministers of Argentina, Brazil, Ecuador, Bolivia, Paraguay, Uruguay, uh, uh, Venezuela. And uh, I redact, I wrote with uh, other economists uh, what was the proposal uh, of Ecuador but it was put in minority by Brazil, Argentina, including Venezuela. And at the end, this Bank of the South, which have been created officially in December, 2008, never entered in activity and never uh, gave any uh, credit. Uh, but I, I wrote a book in English on the Bank of the South as alternative, and I made a lot of proposal. 
uh, including to go out of the model of extraction and export. So how to use the Bank of the South for an integration of the Latin American economies, uh, dotting this Latin American economies of uh, pharmaceutical industry to, to produce generic uh, drugs, uh, an intent to interconnect newly the railways system of the different countries between themselves, because you know the railways and the, all the the big uh, 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 routes roads they are building is always to export uh, uh, and not to interconnect the the economy. So we, we had a lot of good proposal uh, linked to. Uh, a mechanism of money, uh, the sucre, uh, which could represent an alternative to the dollar in the region, and uh, it was not implemented. If you listened la last week to Lula, he said in the CELAC meeting in Buenos Aires one week ago that he would be in favor of a common money between. Argentina and Brazil. Uh, I think it's rhetoric. I don't think he will do that, but uh, at any way, there is this uh, proposal in the in the agenda, and we have to intervene personally. I, I am intervening as uh, as I can in this type of debate, explaining uh, what could be the the alternative at the level of the money, at the level of the development banks, etc. So thank you for the very interesting question. Okay, I can start. Um, thank you very much for the presentation, for the work uh, th coming from the third world. It's good to see people here uh, fighting for that. Thank you also for my colleagues for the presentations and uh, very good questions. Um, oh yeah, also about the, just because you mentioned the Brazilian uh, and Argentinian new common currency, I'm from Brazil. I think what is in the in the table for discussion is not a currency like the euro, it's more uh, like a commercial currency between the two countries. Mm. So why would that be, uh, why would that be bad for debt? Uh, I think that's one question, but I had other two questions. Um, one is, uh, you probably uh, saw for sure that in August, China pardoned the debt of 17 countries in Africa. Um, so how this influence of uh, Africa as a creditor you see as changing um, the positions of other debt holders in the West, for example? And third, um, at COP27, one thing that was proposed by many countries like Venezuela and Colombia was um, debt pardoning um, conditional to climate policy. So how do you see that? And do you, do, do you see that as, a, as something that the Europe, Europe would be interested in, for example? Uh, th thank you so much. What is Professor. your name? Wow. Wow. Thank you. My name is Mohamed. I am from Mauritania. Uh, first of all, thank you for the great presentation. I did my bachelor's at University of Paris 3 and uh, mm -hmm. my professor Daniel Lang did mention your, your work many times in our classes of economics. And so it's an honor, of honor for me here to be present today for the presentation. I have two questions about the role of debt in economic development, because back in 2005, there was a, a coup d'etat in Mauritania. And after that, uh, Mauritania's creditors decided to forgive the debt if Mauritania engages in a democratic process. The government did then run a democratic election, and we had a new president. 
but a price, and then the, the debt was largely forgiven and it fell to around 20, 25% of GDP from 120 to 25% of GDP. Uh, after that, the government engaged in wasteful spending, uh, wasteful infrastructure that reminded me of Kwame Nkrumah after the independence of Ghana. And so what resulted after that is that the debt went from 25% to 60, 70%. Mm. There was an increase of uh, corruption. There was no real, uh, no real economic uh, uh, growth even though the coup d'etat and the support by the population was driven by a fear that the, that the economy was going to collapse. So here the debt was playing uh, some kind of, uh, was moving the people to demand their rights. But once the debt was more or less forgiven, people acqu acquiesced and f forgave about, forgot about the economy. And so things went back to the former, to the former population position more or less. So my question here is that, uh, how do you think can we, at, on, on the one hand, forgive debt in order to help developing countries, but on, on, on the other hand, make sure that they engage in real long-term economic plans? And uh, my second question is, is, is on the role of the debt, say, in, in developed countries, and more or less also in developing countries, because uh, if we look at government bonds, for instance, uh, they could be used by banks and by companies as collateral as uh, to prove reserves. Th they could be used to facilitate international transactions. I'm speaking here about government bonds. And so I'm just, uh, uh, do you see any nefarious role for debt in this context as a facilitator of financial transaction? Set of questions. I, I give okay. Now about um, the Brazilian proposal, I just uh, read a little because uh, uh, the, I don't know the, the name of this economist who is influencing uh, Galio. Maybe you know the, the name of the Brazilian economist uh, who is influencing. Uh, Lula, but I didn't really uh, read uh, in this case what would be the the proposal of Lula. I, when I was an advisor to the Ecuadorian government, I participated to a meeting where Mantega, who was the financial minister of Brazil, participated, and he said that he was totally in favor of a regional money taking as an example the euro and saying that uh, we should uh, realize implement an integration in latin america like uh, the european did and i have tried to say to several persons that the the real thing about the euro and the European Union is not uh, what they imagine and not so positive. Of course, for somebody like Brazil, if he think that it will allow Brazil to do the same as Germany is doing inside the Eurozone, at the level of the interest of the elites, of Brazil, yes, it would be a good thing for, uh, I, I don't know if you understand what I am saying, because it, the Eurozone is dominated by some economies, some countries, and uh,
namely, when he, he spoke about his country, Brazil, he said it's a sub imperialism. Uh, what was the, my country, what was the uh, some system of domination and relating to the neighbor? And if you analyze what is doing India with Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Pakistan, not Pakistan because some that they are important, but with Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, uh, in some way also India reproduce mechanism of uh, a sub imperialism. Uh, and South Africa and ultra Africa. But okay. Uh, China's creditor. Yes, they say that uh, are canceling the debt of 17 countries, but we don't have exactly the information. It, it was a declaration, and uh, we have really to follow what exactly happened. Um, and the question of the threats that on Asia, which is the proposal of Gustavo Petro, new president of Colombia. Uh, the General Assembly, and he made the same proposal in Davos uh, two or two weeks ago. We are, we are very critical uh, because uh, we think that the risk is to keep on with conditionalities imposed by the creditor. We are in favor of auditing the debt, uh, cancelling uh, the illegitimate part of the debt, and financing, of course, separately, investment for the uh, protection of nature, uh, struggle against climate change, uh, etc., and not linking the two things. Because if you say, a swaps, so uh, a ch exchanging debt for investment in nature, it means that you recognize the debt and you want it to change. But so you are not questioning the debt and that's the problem. We decided uh, 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 a week ago at CEDTM to convoke our annual meeting in Latin America and Colombia and to propose a, a discussion with the, with the presidency of Colombia. We will invite uh, parliamentarians of Brazil, Argentina, uh, the European Parliament, etc., to, to discuss this proposal. But we are critical and we published uh, I can send you the link with our declaration, our statement on that question. Uh, thank you, Mohamed. Uh, you have uh, Mauritania, I don't know if you know that, at the independence, France uh, uh, forced the new government of Mauritania to recognize the colonial debt. Uh, uh, a huge amount of, uh, uh, of a credit asked by France to the World Bank. And so uh, it was in contradiction with, the, with international law. But so Mauritania as an independent country Big, began its life, its life with a debt burden which was odious. Um, at which condition uh, the, con the possibility of the decision of cancelling debt could be in favor of the people? I, I would say the people should be part of the process, controlling the process, avoiding corruption, uh, embezzlement uh, of the, uh, the, the, the members of the government, etc. 
and also to intervene in uh, defining what to do with the financial resources of the country for which project of development, etc. So for us, the, the, the participation of the citizenship is fundamental. And uh, in general, World Bank and IMF, you know, they invite the civil society, but it's not a real participatory process. It's a, a lot of manipulation, a lot of rhetoric uh, with the civil society, but in, in reality, the, the demands of the population are not really taken into account by the World Bank and the IMF. And thank you very much for your question. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation and to my colleagues. Um, I'm from Uruguay, uh, Joaquin, but I'm gonna ask you, I'm, I'm gonna focus on Argentina. So uh, over the presentation, you were mentioning about like all of these cases in which regimes uh, take debt and then that can be judged ex post considering like uh, if they're um, authoritarian regimes or the, the use they do for the debt, as you mentioned in the case of um, Greece that you evaluated. And in Argentina, you have that uh, it has a long history of debt increase. Over the, the dictatorship, it grew like 14 times, but then also in the previous government, the one from Macri, the debt increased like a uh, hundred percent in a context in which the GDP fell by 25%. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Macri, you cannot really say directly that the use of that money was to repress the population. It was a democratically elected government in an uh, almost full democracy, according to many indicators. So it's a bit more complicated to, to really assess and to judge. Whereas at the same time, uh, capital flight is estimated in 90 billion. And there are some estimations that the government subsidized private individuals purchase of foreign currency by 17 billion. So like there are numbers, but how do you really assess this kind of case? And how do you judge this kind of debt taking? And maybe um, expanding a bit on the question, um, there is a process going on, especially in, in Latin America and South America, that in Uruguay we call the judicialization of the um, of politics, in which politicians are judged uh, in penal terms, like uh, for their actions of rulers, and and, and mm -hmm. so the political acts are judged on judicial terms and leading to a lot of uh, polarity, uh, polarization, and and, and instability. Mm -hmm. So. This judgment of the debt, how do you think is helping or not to this mm -hmm. process? And, and, and how do you do it in a way that doesn't really end up affecting democracy itself mm -hmm. and, and the, like the independence from the political power to the judicial or, or like uh, the executive decisions to the judicial decisions? Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor. Also, thank you, uh, my colleagues, Marla, Juanma, and Noor. Um, so I have two questions. First, um, well, uh, my name is Gabriel. I'm also Brazilian. So I'd like you to, uh, if possible, elaborate a bit more on the sub-imperialism comment. Uh, I, I imagine you are mentioning Rui Mauro Marini when you talk about the, yeah, dependence, um, exactly. this, this idea. Um, do you think it still applies? Because his idea back in time was that Brazil was like a middle industrialized country. And it, in some way, it was working as the same way as industrialized countries, but regionally um, outsourcing and looking for, uh, I would say, uh, cheap work around Latin America. And I mean, the capital, the bourgeois that was class that was swarming there would also do this in Latin America and look for better opportunities. Do you, do you think it still uh, applies after like the large deindustrialization we had? Um, I don't know because I see much more that we are playing the game of China right now. As for example, China um, kind of trying to be being a source of uh, dis disrupts disruptancy and uh, uh, disrupting Mercosur, for example. Now trying to, for example, negotiate with Uruguay. So. 
uh, I'd like to know if you think it still applies because it was very specific called the Brazilian industrialization process and now mm -hmm. it's mostly gone. Uh, and then the second question, and I'd like to hear more about your opinion on the uh, the bank of the, the BRICS, I forgot the name now. Uh, what's the name of the BRICS? New Development Bank. Um, and why you think it's uh, still very bad, if you could uh, explain a bit more. And my, this question is like around the picture of if you think that the new Chinese institutions, um, especially concerning financial institutions that they are uh, helping to build, you think they have a, at the end the very same nature as the ones built by the US after the Second World War, or you think they have a different nature and if you think the different nature, what is this one? I mean, I I, I think sometimes we, we, we have this like, is it imperialist or not? And it seems like black or white. Um, and I don't know, I think China's new institutions may be fixed in the kind of gray. And I'd like to hear an opinion about this more. Thank you. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Otto. And um, I wanted to ask a general question about this current situation. Um, so I've understood that one of the reasons why um, Europe and the US has had low inflation um, for a few decades now is because of, glo of glo global value change, uh, chains, which um, have allowed um, firms in the core to have low costs because they basically exploit workers in the global south. Um, Recently, uh, Cédric Durand, he published a paper uh, in the New Left, Left Review where he argues that this system has been disturbed and because it has been disturbed, we will start experiencing more and more inflation um, starting from now. And this will be tackled by increasing the interest rates, which, which we're seeing, but like also in the longer term. So I wanted to hear your kind of um, ideas um, about how the global lending and borrowing system will most likely adjust to this change, like having higher inflation and then having higher interest rates all the time, kind of. Um, yeah, but thank you for your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> and from uh, Uruguay, what is, what is your name? Joaquin. Okay. Um, yeah, for me, it's very important to say that the nature of the government is not a criteria. So Macri government was the, it was democratically uh, elected. It was not a dictatorship, but the debt, the credit he asked to the IMF in 2018, he asked for $45 billion. It, it, at this epoch, it was the main uh, credit given by the IMF to a country in all the history. Uh, this credit is clearly odious because it, it, the purpose of uh, asking for this credit was to guarantee his own re-election in 2019. And uh, Trump uh, insists on the IMF, on the US representation in the IMF and the allies of the US in the IMF to say, we have to support this guy. Macri, because it is our ally in Latin America if the left is coming to the to be elected we will lose uh, influence uh, and as you mentioned because uh, immediately the money given by the MF the IMF went out of the countries. It has not been invested in, in the countries. Macri lost uh, the election in 2019. Uh, I was in, to, 
2019 in the in Argentina, I met people uh, from the presidential majority in this epoch, Frente uh, de Todos. I was in Argentina in 2022 in March when they when the government of Alberto Fernandez decided to ask the IMF, you know how much money? 45 billion dollars to the IMF in 2022 to buy back the IMF for the loan of 45 billion dollars. A new debt to pay back an odious debt. So uh, I explained that to the media. I was invited by uh, 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 including uh, uh, right-wing medias, Clarin uh, and uh, the nation, uh, La Nation. Uh, he, of course, I met the Kirchnerista sector of the of the uh, Frente de Todos, who was opposed to this uh, to this agreement. So no, for me it's very clear. It's the Macri uh, uh, or the the IMF loan to the Macri government is a clear, odious loan, including it is against the the rules of the IMF because uh, the in the rules of the IMF it says. These rules say the IMF can only give a loan to a government if giving this loan will make sustainable the debt. Uh, and giving a loan of $45 billion, uh, it was very clear that it will not make sustainable the Argentinian uh, debt. So, uh that's my answer and about uh yes uh this uh concept of sub imperialism was elaborated by uh, Mauro Marini which was a marxist brazilian marxist economist member of the uh the school of dependency with uh, Carlos Enrique Cardoso, uh, Teotonio dos Santos, uh, André Gunder, Frank, and, and others. And really, I think that uh, this characterization is still uh, accurate to, to understand the, the role of Brazil. I agree with you that uh, in some way, uh, there is a you you say this industrialization of uh, Brazil. I agree in some way, but the big Brazilian corporation, I, I would say, are stronger than uh, uh, the situation in the Marini epoch. You know uh, better than me. The, the influence of Odebrecht on several governments. Odebrecht is, uh, people, uh, maybe you don't know, but it's uh, a corporation who built uh, roads, a bridge, uh, uh, thermical uh, 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 plants, a production of power plants, uh, and they have more than 100,000 workers. They receive credit from Brazil by, through the BNDS, which is the Development Bank of Brazil. So they receive the money from the government uh, to have the money to invest in uh, countries like Ecuador, Peru, and uh, including Mexico. And you have several governments who, who were uh, in crisis because of the corruption created by uh, 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 Odebrecht. But you have also uh, Juan Andrade, which is also 
big uh, corporation in, in building, uh, uh, inclu including, I think, nuclear plant. And you have uh, uh, Petrobras and Rio Valle Dossi, who have also big interest in that. So yes, I, I think, uh, and you have to think about why Brazil intervened in Haiti, leading the MINUSTA, why, what was the purpose? So the purpose was to show to the big imperialism, the US, that uh, the Brazil is capable to take a, a part of the task of uh, uh, controlling the situation in the region as an ally of, uh, uh, of USA. Of course, in the new situation, I am in favor of Lula government against Bolsonaro. I have absolutely no doubt, doubt uh, about that. But I have not no much illusion on, on what Lula will do because it aligns with Alckmin in the in the presidency and uh, uh, in general is orientation about the new development bank i cannot develop because uh, but really uh, my friend if you look for uh, on our website of the CRDTM, patrick bond is a professor of university in in south africa and he he wrote a lot of article analyzing a concrete project financed by the New Development Bank. And Otto, uh, I am not sure that I understood your, your question. I am sorry. Uh, could you summarize it if we have the time? Yeah. So basically, because the global value chain system has been disturbed, um, with Europe and the US will start experiencing higher higher inflation all the time, not only now, but also in the future. And that's why central banks will start tackling inflation with high interest rates, also in the longer run. And yeah, that will call like create a conjuncture with higher inflation and higher interest rates. Like, yeah, not only now, but yeah, mm -hmm. in the run as well. So I wanted to hear your ideas about like what that would mean for the global borrowing lending system. Mm -hmm. We have like higher interest rates constantly because we have had quite low interest rates um, for for a time now. Yeah, no, I, I I think that since the unilateral decision of the main central banks will provoke a, a very difficult situation for the peripheral economies, uh, and we are. Not, we are not sure that it will it will allow, including the economies of the north, to really control inflation. We will see, but uh, it, we see now it's the, the the situation is very mo moving because uh, there is some because of the decrease of the price of the gas, as you know, uh, uh, because of the over uh, accumulation of the, comment la, le, le stockage de, du gas in Europe, now the price uh, uh, went down uh, something like 50% in comparison with uh, several months ago. So this influence now, in a decrease of the rate of inflation, but I would say there is a real danger of what was named in the past stagflation to, the, to name a situation in which we have stagnation of the growth of the economy or recession and a real positive uh, uh, inflation rate and exactly what will happen we don't know but it is sure that it's not in favor 
of the peripheral economies. It's absolutely uh, sure. And uh, how the central banks will deal with that because they know also increasing interest rate logically will provoke uh, 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 in vague, uh, a wave of bankruptcies of zombies corporations. So corporations who were able to refinance their debt because of low interest rate, now with increasing interest rate, a part of the zombies corporation should go bankrupt. And it could be a, a, a purpose of the decision of the director of the Fed and Lagarde uh, uh, to, to provoke what uh, uh, Schumpeter was uh, naming as uh, come on, constructive destruction and uh, uh, the need of a wave of bankruptcy to clean the system. Maybe they are going in this direction. It's not clear. Maybe when they will see a wave of bankruptcy, they will change. They will move to another policy. We don't know. So we are in a real transitory situation, a moving situation. And I am not Madame Soleil to say exactly what will happen. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much.